Good luck. Submitted for your approval, a Mr. Henry Bemis, a man obsessed with podcasts, but with no way to listen to them. His computer has broken down, his iPod Nano fell in the bidet, and all his savings have gone toward his ex-wife's elective surgeries. But one afternoon, walking past the local pawn shop, Mr. Bemis sees something wondrous. The pawnbroker, placing a slightly used 40 gigabyte MP3 player in the window. The price tag? Exactly what Mr. Bemis has in his pocket. I don't believe it. Space enough at last. He quickly buys up the electronic device, thanks the man, and rushes home to listen to his enormous backlog of entertaining and insightful podcasts. But to Mr. Bemis's horror, he discovers that the MP3 player already contains a podcast. In fact, it is completely filled with episodes of the Doomsteep Audio Fiction Magazine. That's not fair. That's not fair. There is a fifth dimension, one between the land of cold fact and boundless fancy, between shadow and substance. Between one and two on a scale from one to ten, there's a misspelled sign up ahead. Your next stop, the Doonsteep Audio Fiction Magazine. And now your hosts, Wish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Hi. Hi. Uh, welcome to the Doonsteep Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume two, number four, page twelve. Hmm. I'm Big Anklevich. I'm Rish Outfield. Lock up your wives and daughters. Announcer man is here. Whoa. <laughs> wow, he's in a good mood. Yeah, he's turned all Casanova. I wouldn't have expected a crusty old man that smokes a pipe all the time to whip out something like that. Right on. What? Or don't all your friends smoke pipes? You know, I, I think you're the only person I've ever known in my whole life that smokes a pipe, actually. You know, that might apply to me, too. Weird. Interesting. That's just sort of gone out of fashion, hasn't it? Yeah. Maybe it's more trouble than cigarettes and cigars. It's possible. Maybe it's just because you have to be a whaler or a sea captain of some sort to smoke a pipe. You know you like it. Did we have a story today? Yes. Today's story is Kingdom of Flies by Merrill Page. Merrill Page is a television editor who writes in his spare time what a little of it remains after his kids have finally gone to bed. He's had a Drabble on the Drabblecast, as well as a story previously here on the Dune, Steve. Way back in our second episode with Stalled. So check that story out if you haven't yet. We'd like to thank Brian Lincoln for producing today's episode. Also thanks to John Riendo and Liz Lincoln for lending their voices to the story. Today's music was by Scarlatti Tilt and Callie Casino on Music Alley. Some sound effects were provided by SoundSnap and others are from the Free Sound Project. Check out the links in the show notes. Kingdom of Flies by Merrill Page A fly buzzed past Craig Payne's ear. He swished his hand at it, then resumed concentrating on what the contractors were telling him. You need to be sure to clean the hot air vent and the hose. If you let it fill with lint and stuff, you run a real risk of fire, said Ken, the head contractor. Well, how often do you recommend cleaning it? asked Kelly. The same question had just occurred to Craig, but Kelly had beaten him to the asking. It was her day, after all. At long last, they were finally becoming homeowners. It was a lifelong dream for Kelly. For Craig, it was important. It proved his life was going somewhere. For Kelly, however, it seemed to validate her whole existence. It was all she ever wanted in life. It really depends, said Ken. A good way to know if your vent and hose need cleaning is whether your clothes are getting dry or not. If your lint screen is clear and your clothes aren't getting dry as quickly as they used to, then you probably need to clean the system out. It'll probably take a year or two before you get to that point, but it's always better to be safe than sorry, so it wouldn't hurt to check it every year. They stepped out of the laundry room. Kelly glanced back at Craig, who was at the end of the procession, flicked a finger towards the room and grinned. Craig grinned back at her and blew her a kiss. This was the first time they would have a separate laundry room, 
unless you count the apartments in which the laundry was done down the hall, and Craig didn't count that. Craig was sort of excited. Maybe he would be wearing dirty clothes to work a little less often, but not nearly as excited as Kelly. In this modern day and age, she still considered herself a homemaker, even though she worked 20 hours a week at a part-time job. After all, she was home most of the day with their daughter Olivia. Ken led them to the stairs and down, and Craig could have sworn that Kelly's feet didn't actually touch the ground. This was it for them. The American dream had come true. Six years of struggling along as renters were over. A fly landed on Kelly's head, and she waved a hand to shoo it. It flitted upwards, then dove for Craig's nose. His hand snapped to his face and brushed the fly away. Then he tried to whack it out of the air unsuccessfully. His nose hurt a little. Apparently he'd been a little too zealous in brushing it away. There sure are a lot of flies, Craig said. He looked up at the high ceiling in the stairway. There were at least five flies on the ceiling near the light fixture, and several more in the empty air beneath. Ken looked up at the swarm and smiled. Yeah, it's like that out here. It gets to the point where you just have to give them names and keep them as pets. Kelly giggled and Craig snorted. <laughs> Actually, with all the workers coming in and out to finish up, the doors were pretty much always open. There was just no way to keep them out. Don't worry, we'll take care of them all before you move in. At the bottom of the stairs were two bedrooms and a bathroom. Kelly smiled again, as broad as her mouth would allow. Olivia's future bedroom was already painted a light sage green, the color Kelly had chosen. She squeezed Craig's arm. I can't wait to move in. She squeaked. He snorted. <sighs> Moving in was not the fun part. That was a lot of work, and it was something they'd done several times in their short married life. I can't wait to be moved in, Craig replied. Tuscan garden summer's day The insects arrive for the table lay Craig rumbled through the streets of Whitewood in the U-Haul. He hated driving this monstrosity, and it was one of the smaller models available. A normal-sized car was just fine for Craig. He could handle a van, but the driver's seat in these trucks put him up so high he felt like he must be flying rather than driving. He knew it was just a matter of time before he hit something. His own neighborhood came into view as he turned the corner. It was your standard suburban street, well, your standard newly constructed suburban street anyway, with tiny planted trees, grass in the front yard, and dirt in the back, and no fences or landscaping yet. As a matter of fact, Whitewood was a newly constructed town. It had only been in existence for seven years. The town was founded in 1996. At that time, it was almost completely empty land that was purchased from a bankruptcy, broken up by a few patchwork farms. Developers saw the dollar signs and began building houses everywhere. The houses were very inexpensive because the land had only cost a song. Suddenly, people like Craig, who were willing to make an L.A.-style commute in nearly an hour to Denver, were able to buy a house at a great price and live the American dream. There were no businesses in town yet. The city hall and public library were in trailers, but at least the fire station had a real building. Nearly everyone in town was just like Craig and Kelly, young couples with a child or two, eager to own their own home and play at being adults. He pulled up to the house and backed the U-Haul into the driveway. It was quite an undertaking, and he panicked for a moment when he thought he'd gone too far and clipped the porch. He felt like kicking himself. He should have just waited until Kelly got there so she could guide him back. Luckily, he had stopped in time, and he would be moving his family into an unbroken house. Kelly, who had been following the moving van, still hadn't turned the corner onto their street. Craig thought he'd seen her make a pit stop at the gas station in Sarasota Springs five minutes back, although he hadn't been sure because he was so terrible at using side-view mirrors. Her non-arrival confirmed his suspicion. It would be at least five minutes before she showed up. Craig didn't want to wait. He pulled out his shiny new key and unlocked the bolt and knob on the front door. Honey, I'm home! he shouted as he walked in. The echo bounced around the empty house like a super ball hurled at full force. The place smelled like new paint. Craig breathed deeply. It was his new paint. 
He owned it, as long as he managed to pay the bank for the privilege each month anyway. He walked through the living room to the kitchen, turned down the hall towards his new bedroom, and pushed on the already half-open door. He looked in, then proceeded to the bathroom, then the study. The new paint smell filled his nostrils and forced his mouth into a smile. It was his. The walls, the carpets, the doors, the lights. They were all his. He owned them. Craig went back to the bathroom. He peed in the toilet. He wanted to proclaim it the first pee in his new toilet. But he had to be honest with himself. He had peed in this toilet once before when they had come out for the walkthrough. It was the first pee since he owned the toilet, though. So as lord of the manor, he proclaimed it the first. He went down the stairs and looked at each room, then came back up the stairs. Something about the place seemed different, but he couldn't put his finger on it. He went back to the door and slid it open. The dirt of the backyard seemed unspoiled since their last visit days ago. As he stood there, a fly zoomed past his ear into the house. That was it, he realized. True to his word, Ken had removed all the flies from the house. Now there was a new one. Craig had let in his first fly. As lord of the manor, he proclaimed it the first fly. He wanted to get a fly swatter and kill it so he could proclaim it the first dead fly, but there was no fly swatter in the house yet. There was nothing at all in the house. Instead of standing around proclaiming a bunch of worthless firsts, he decided he should go out and get started hauling in boxes. It was time to act like a pack mule. He went to the garage door and propped it open to facilitate the lugging of heavy, awkward boxes. He pushed the doorbell-like button that opened the outer garage door and headed for the truck. As Craig opened the back of the moving truck and surveyed his choices, the second fly to enter the house flew in the open door followed closely by the third. Taste your sugar, leave before the rain. The crickets play their soft refrain. Craig had gone through five moves since he married Kelly six years ago. He was happy to know that since they owned the house this time, this would probably be the last move for a long time. After nearly 12 hours of furious activity, the cyclone finally spun down. The helpers left, and Craig and Kelly found themselves alone at last in their new home. They put Olivia to bed in her room. It was still furnished only with boxes. They laid her on a mattress on the floor because her bed frame still needed reassembling. Craig kissed her forehead, then placed a butterfly kiss on each cheek. Olivia scolded him. No, Daddy, that side is for this cheek and that side is for this cheek. It was very important to her that his left eye give the butterfly kiss to her right cheek, and vice versa. No turning of the head was allowed. Craig gave her new butterfly kisses following her instructions, tucked her in, and the two of them left her to sleep her first night in her brand new room, a Winnie the Pooh nightlight watching over her. Craig and Kelly were exhausted. Once they reached the top of the stairs, they went straight for the couch and plopped down. Kelly snuggled into the crook of his arm, despite the sweat that still clung to him. She looked up at him and smiled. It was a deeply satisfied smile. Craig heard a fly buzz over his head. Can you believe it's finally real? Craig smiled. A year ago, I wouldn't have believed you if you said this would happen. A buzzing fly swooped near their heads, catching their attention. They both glanced up at it as it soared through the open space of their living room and headed for a perch on the ceiling. There, it joined a veritable circus troop of house flies. There must have been thirty flies congregating at the peak of the vaulted ceiling. They chased each other in circles, crawled about aimlessly, or simply sat, basking in the warmth of the late summer air. Flies buzzed everywhere. The buzzing grew considerably louder when one fly would take it into his head to chase another fly. The flies floated and dove, banked and soared and zigzagged. It made Kelly and Craig's lips curl. Do we have a fly swatter? He couldn't remember. There hadn't been much call for one in California. I don't think so. If we do, I have no idea what box it's in. 
We need to get one then. The sooner the better. This buzzing is going to drive me crazy. He pushed himself up. Let's go to bed. I'm tired. While they waited for their house to be completed, Craig and Kelly had lived with his sister. Craig had started his new job three months ago. The house was a new part of his life, but his job was already old hat. He was already watching the clock tick down to five each day, desperate to dash for the door. Why can't jobs stay fun? I guess when you're the IT systems guy, you might as well be the janitor. You spend each day cleaning up other people's messes, and that isn't fun for anyone. Craig strolled up the front walk to the door. The van was still ticking as it cooled, which meant that Kelly and Olivia had just returned from somewhere as well. He pushed open the door, which wasn't closed all the way, and saw Kelly removing groceries from a pile of bags she'd made on the kitchen table. Hey guys, we've got to keep the door closed. There's too many flies coming in all the time. Sorry, honey. It's just hard to bring all these bags in and worry about that, too. Did you get me a fly swatter? Oh, shoot. No, I'm sorry, I forgot. Do do you think Smith's will have one? Smith's was the local grocery store, just five minutes away in Sarasota Springs. Craig could tell by the bags on the table that Kelly had come from the Walmart, almost 20 minutes away in American Fork. I'm sure Smith's will have one. It's a real grocery store, not some country corners or something. All right, I'll be right back then. Wait! Help me unload the groceries before you go. He ignored her. He was already gone. Craig held the fly swatter in one hand and a baby wipe in the other. After killing the first fly and leaving a red smear on his brand new, pristinely painted walls, he realized he was going to need something to clean up the mess. Baby wipes were such a wonderful tool. Olivia was three and had been potty trained for a little over a year, but they kept buying baby wipes because they were just so useful around the house. Craig tracked a low-moving fly, waiting for it to land so he could smack it. He was learning one thing from this exercise. He wasn't very good at killing flies. One would think, with as many flies as were now making his home their home, that there would be a horrific body count after ten minutes of hunting but it had been a pretty small harvest so far. The flies seemed to have a sixth sense for avoiding Craig. Before he could get within striking distance, they would leap from their perches and buzz away. Most of the flies would land in the peak of the vaulted ceiling, far out of reach from Craig and his fly swatter, even if Craig stood on a chair, which he'd already tried. He began throwing his fly swatter at the ceiling to disturb the flies and cause them to seek a new resting place. Most of them simply settled back down where they had been before. But each time, at least one fly came within striking distance. Smack! The body count was finally starting to pile up. Craig didn't like to touch the dead ones. Instead, he used his fly sweater like a dustpan and his baby wipe like a broom, scooped up the dead ones and dumped them in the trash can. The other place the flies liked to congregate was the sliding glass door. Like all animals, flies just couldn't grasp the concept of glass. The flies walked around on that glass door, Craig thought, surely wondering if they could see the outside, why couldn't they get there? Craig would have been happy to open the door and shoo them out, but there were flies circling outside the door that would come in if he did. So, instead, he splattered the flies onto the glass, killing them all one by one. Olivia watched him hunting the flies for a long time. Clifford, the big red dog, was playing on the TV, but she didn't even spare it a glance. She seemed entranced by Craig's antics. She reached out her hand for the fly swatter and asked, Daddy, can I try it? There were only a few flies still surviving, at least in the main room. Who knew how many there might be in other rooms? Craig was about ready to quit anyhow. Sure, cutie, give it a shot. Olivia grabbed the swatter and began waving it around crazily. There were no flies anywhere near her in danger of being hit, but Livy sure looked cute. Craig had to pee, so he went down the hall to take care of business. 
Upon returning, he saw that Olivia had grown tired of swinging wildly at empty air. Look, Daddy, it bends! In her hand, the fly swatter now resembled a hula hoop. While Craig had been in the bathroom, she'd bent it into a circle. Hey, don't do that! He shouted. Craig grabbed the fly swatter and tried to bend it back into shape. The best he could do was to get it mostly straight. It didn't work as well after that, but he still managed to kill off the last two flies that he could find. It was software upgrade day. Craig had to go from one computer to another installing the upgrade. It was past midnight when he finally got home from work. He walked in the door from the garage and was greeted with the buzzing of a fly in the laundry room. There were more, a lot more, in the main room. Kelly was washing her face, getting ready for bed in the bathroom. Craig asked her, What's going on? I killed all the flies this morning. Sorry, honey. Olivia kept coming in and out this afternoon, and she never shut the door behind her. I kept closing it, but then she'd go out again and leave it open. Sorry about the flies. Buzz, buzz, buzz. It was late, and today was a terribly draining day. He was tired, but the buzzing everywhere was maddening. He grabbed his bent fly swatter and went to work. It took nearly an hour to be satisfied that he'd killed them all. When he finally came to bed, Kelly was asleep and snoring softly. Craig poured cereal into a bowl and added milk. He sat down and spread the newspaper out in front of him. A fly came down and landed right in the middle of the article he was reading about Keyshawn Johnson's first game with the Dallas Cowboys. Craig smashed his hand down on the table, but the fly flitted away in plenty of time to avoid his blow. Milk sloshed out of his cereal bowl onto the table. Craig had had enough. He shouted in frustration stood up and stormed to the refrigerator. He reached into the gap between the refrigerator and the wall, retrieved the fly swatter from its peg, and scanned the air for the offending fly. He saw three. Three? He'd stayed up late last night, even though he was dead tired, to kill them all. And there were three flies in here again? Drawn by the commotion, Kelly padded into the kitchen. What's going on, Craig? There's freaking flies in here again! Craig shouted. So kill them, then. Kelly responded icily. Craig was past reason. I killed them all yesterday. I stayed up late to kill them all. What the hell? Calm down, Craig. You've got the fly swatter in your hand. Kill them. I don't have time. I've got to get ready for work. Craig flung the fly swatter into the gap between the fridge and the wall, not even bothering with hanging it on the peg. Where's Olivia? He walked to the stairs and shouted her name. Olivia! Then he stomped to his dresser and grabbed a change of underwear and hung it on a hook in the bathroom. Olivia came up the stairs. She was nervous. She could tell that he was very angry, and she was afraid of what awaited her. Craig saw the fearful look in her face and was ashamed of his tirade. He made an effort to calm himself. <sighs> Olivia? Craig began. No more leaving the door open when you go outside, okay? I'm sorry, Daddy. It lets in all the flies. And the flies are driving Daddy crazy, okay? Okay, Daddy. I won't. Thank you. Craig opened the linen closet and grabbed a fresh towel. He brushed past Kelly on his way to the bathroom. Next time you're at the store, can you get some fly paper? We're not hanging that stuff up in the house. Okay. What if we put it in the garage and outside the back door? Fine. Just not in the house. He took his shower quickly. He tried to remain calm and keep his anger from boiling up over small things, like the fact that the shower wasn't draining properly. Craig was sure there was a clog of Kelly's hair wrapped around the plug, but he couldn't figure out how to get the stupid plug out and remove the hair clog. Instead, the tub filled up to his ankles every time he showered. He just couldn't feel as clean when the water from his shower didn't drain away. 
Telly came into the bathroom. She shouted through the shower door. What was that all about, Craig? Sorry, I don't know what my problem is. I just... Listen, Craig, you want to scream and shout and kill flies? That's fine, but don't take it out on us. Especially not Olivia. Okay. You're getting to be hard to live with. She mumbled as she stomped out the door and slammed it behind her. He exited the shower, dressed, and left the house, trying to put his frustration with the flies out of his mind. He had to pull it together. He used to be such an easygoing person, but now his temper had him raging at his innocent little daughter. Pull it together, he thought. But all he wanted to do was go back in the house and kill all three flies he'd seen and searched the house to eradicate any others that might be hiding in other rooms. Craig sat at another computer, trying to solve someone's problem. The software upgrade had reset all of Will's customization, but he couldn't remember how he'd customized it in the first place and so Craig was trying to discover it for him and restore order to his workplace. Rap music thumped softly from Will's speakers. Just then, Tommy passed by. Tommy was the youngest person on staff. Whoa, what's that music you got there, Craig? I don't know, it's Will's stuff. He replied. Will was lurking in the next cubicle while he waited. It's Busybone. Busybone! Said Tommy, bubbling with youthful enthusiasm. Turn it off, man! Craig didn't turn it up. God, I love Busy Bone. I used to listen to Bone Thugs all the time. I don't really listen to hip-hop anymore, but back in the day... Will was in the doorway of the cubicle with Tommy now. I don't really like hip-hop much either, Will said. But I like Busy Bone because he's so crazy. Yeah, no, no, not as crazy as Crazy Bone. Tommy replied with a big knowing smile. Craig couldn't resist. Yeah, but he's a lot busier than Crazy Bone. Tommy didn't laugh. Didn't even chuckle. He just looked at Craig like he was an idiot. At least he didn't groan. But it made Craig feel little all the same. He didn't fit in here at work. He was lonely. Craig's drive home at night was long, but he filled the time listening to a Sue Grafton audiobook. It kept his mind from dwelling on the endless drive and even managed to keep him from remembering the flies that would be waiting for him at home. When he walked in the front door, there they were, though, flying stunt patterns in the air, crawling on the dinner table, and laying eggs on the dishes in the sink. He went to the fridge to grab the fly swatter off the wall, but it wasn't there. Kelly and Olivia were at the store, so he couldn't ask them where it was. He looked for a minute, then gave up he began stalking the flies bare-handed. Trying to use his hand as a fly swatter achieved minimal success. He did manage to catch one slow enough to be crushed by his hand, but just one. The rest were too quick. He remembered that someone back in high school had said that the best way to kill a fly was to clap your hands together right above them. Then the flies would fly right into your closing hands while trying to escape. Craig tried it, and it worked amazingly well. Craig clapped six flies dead and could see only one remaining in the room. He watched it patiently, waiting for it to land so he could do it like he'd done its friends. It buzzed along and Craig tracked its flight. Then it flew in front of a dark background and Craig lost it, only to pick it up later in a new corner of the room. The fly was not being cooperative. It continued to swoop around the room refusing all the desirable landing places that it passed in its flight. It even buzzed Craig's face once, then twice. When it came in for a third approach, Craig lost his patience and swung at it. The wind blew the fly off course, but Craig's hand did no damage. Just when Craig was sure he couldn't look more ridiculous, he felt the fly thump against his palm. It plummeted, and crashed to the floor where it thrashed about trying to right itself. Craig stomped on it. That felt good. Craig 
Craig developed a routine. Each day he came home from work, set down his lunch bag and car keys, and killed the 10 to 15 flies that awaited him. Then he washed his hands, had dinner with the family, and watched TV. He tried each day to make the sport of fly killing more difficult. Sometimes he tried a rolled up newspaper, other times his bare hand, sometimes clapping, other times swatting them out of mid air. It became such a joy to him that he no longer complained when Olivia left the door open all day long. After weeks of carnage, the flies started to abate. When Craig arrived home at night, instead of ten flies, there were only three. Craig felt unsatisfied on nights like these. He would stalk the rest of the house, hoping to scare up a few more quarries. Sometimes, when that failed, he would even stand outside on the back porch, hoping for another fly to wander close enough to his fly trap. Craig wandered into Olivia's room, fly swatter in hand, on the trail of a fly. Olivia was playing on the floor with a friend. They had set up a town of little people toys and were acting out the lives of those squat plastic people. Olivia looked up and saw Craig closing in on the fly that had landed on the glass of her bedroom window. Daddy! Don't kill that fly. He's my pet. He's your pet, is he? Yes. That's cute. Smack. He splattered the fly across the glass. Daddy! Gasped Olivia with annoyance. The next day, Olivia was on the couch watching Dora the Explorer, when Craig stepped in front of the TV and swatted a fly perched on the entertainment center. Daddy! shouted Olivia with the same exasperated tone as the day before. That was my favorite fly! Mine too, honey, he said, and stashed the fly swatter next to the fridge. The next morning, Craig was thinking about Olivia's recent comments as he ate breakfast. He dipped the spoon into the bowl, fishing out a load of Cheerios to shovel into his mouth. He was remembering Ken, the contractor's comment about naming flies and keeping them as pets, and wondering if Olivia had a name for the flies he'd killed, when a big black fly buzzed down and perched on top of his floating oats. Damn it! It was every day with this crap. He couldn't even eat in peace. The fly walked around in the mound of cereal as casual as could be. Craig decided that this fly would pay above and beyond. Death was not enough. He tried his familiar clapping trick, only this time he cupped his hands. It worked perfectly. When his hands snapped together, the fly was trapped in his palms, alive. Craig could hear it buzzing in there. He shook the fly like a bottle of salad dressing, then threw it hard under the table. It lay there, stunned. Craig snatched up a drinking glass and trapped it underneath. Then he went to the bathroom and grabbed the tweezers. He shook the cup until the fly was sufficiently stunned, then opened its prison and ripped off its wings with the tweezers. Yeah, that's what you get for ruining my cereal. Craig imagined the fly shrieking in pain. He wished he could hear it. He placed the glass over the fly and shook it up again. Then, he plucked its legs off, one at a time. He'd heard about kids doing this sort of thing to spiders. When he was a kid, he'd never tried it, although he had fried ants with a magnifying glass. Most kids grow out of it, and Craig thought it was a little strange to be growing into it as an adult. It was really fun. It assuaged some of the rage that always seemed to be bubbling just under the surface these days. The fly was now nothing but a black ball sitting on the table. What do you call a guy with no legs and no arms sitting on your front porch? Craig grabbed a corner of the newspaper and swept the ruined fly onto the floor. He didn't want to kill it. He wanted it to live the rest of its pitiful life legless on the kitchen floor. The more suffering, the better. If only he could hear it scream. Matt, said Craig, finishing the ancient joke. 
He took his bowl of cereal to the sink and poured it down the drain. He grabbed his keys and went out the door. He'd get a McMuffin on the way to work. Craig pulled up in his aging neon and saw Olivia sitting on the swing on the front porch, her dangling feet bouncing. Kelly was on her knees in the flower bed pulling weeds with her headphones on. She looked up and waved with a muddy hand as Craig strolled up the front walk. He sat down on the swing next to Olivia. She was chomping on chicken nuggets and french fries. Hey cutie, what are you eating? Is that dinner? Yeah. Is there some for me? Inside, Olivia said. You didn't get a happy meal. That's okay. I don't like Hello Kitty toys that much anyway. Is my food in there with the flies? Hmm, I don't know, Olivia said. The king of the flies said that they were going to stay away. Really? The king of the flies? Yeah, Daddy. He said that the flies will leave you alone if you leave them alone. Is the king of the flies your pet fly? No, Daddy. He's the king. The king. That's cute, Livy. Who is the queen of the flies? Tinkerbell? No, not Tinkerbell. I don't know the queen, just the king. But he says you better stop or else. Or else? Yeah, or else. Or else what? I don't know, Daddy. You want a fry? She held one out to him, smiling. Craig smiled and took it, crunching it in his teeth kids in their imagination. Craig scrolled up to the first offer he'd seen. It was pretty reasonable for a flight from Denver to Cleveland. Christmas in Cleveland, he thought. It's the stuff carols are written about. He clicked the Buy Now button and a new screen began loading, but before it finished, he heard a very loud buzzing sound. He spun around in his chair and saw a fat, black fly floating around the room. It was so loud it seemed more like a hummingbird had flown into the room. This would be the most enjoyable fly he'd kill yet. He got up off his chair, walked to the door, and shut it behind him to ensure the fly would be there when he returned with the swatter. He grabbed it from the wall beside the fridge, and a big grin spread across his face. Back in the study, he closed the door behind him again. It was silent. The fly must have landed somewhere. He scanned the wall, but couldn't locate that telltale spot of black. He walked around the room waving the fly swatter, trying to rouse the fly from its hiding place. He was wagging his swatter in the direction of the bookshelf when the loud buzzing burst from the closet behind him. Craig spun and caught a glimpse of the fly before it flew past a section of dark background and disappeared from view. He continued to scan the air, following the buzz. He felt goosebumps rise on his arms. His sense of anticipation was immense. He spotted it floating like a fat blimp, outlined against the white wall. It was flying so slow that Craig decided it would be worth taking a swipe at. He swung and the fly swatter dropped straight for the lazy fly. At the last possible second, the fly darted out of the swatter's path. Ah, so you're not just a fat turkey after all. He swiped at it again, just missing. A sideways chop. A downward stroke. Another swipe. Then it disappeared into a dark background again. Craig waited patiently, listening to the buzz. A grin on his face and a gleam in his eye. The buzz stopped. Craig glanced around, searching for the black spot on the wall or desk. He felt a tingle on the back of his neck. The fly was walking on his skin. His hand snapped to his neck, but the buzzing had already begun again. He swiped at it again and again. This was definitely the hardest fly to kill yet. No wonder it was so big. The only flies that had given him similar trouble had escaped out open doors to disappear altogether. Craig had learned that lesson, though. This fly would inevitably die. No escape. The fly buzzed directly in front of him, and he slashed with the swatter. 
Again, the fly easily dodged. But Craig made a mad stab with his empty left palm and caught it with a square blow. The huge fly sailed across the room and thumped off the wall. It fell to the carpet, unmoving. Craig walked over, ready to stomp it if necessary, but he could see that it wasn't. The fly was quite dead, laying on its side, not even twitching. Craig filled with pleasure from the satisfying kill. His body coursed with adrenaline. He felt like he could punch a hole through a brick wall. He remembered the mumbo-jumbo Olivia had been spouting the day before. So passes the king of the flies, he proclaimed. Then he laid the fly swatter down next to the fly and scooped it up. He walked down the hall, headed for the garbage can, the fly king's final resting place. When Kelly screamed, ah! Craig jumped and the fly tumbled off the swatter. Then he dropped the swatter altogether. What's going on? Craig shouted down the stairs. Craig, come quick! Kelly screamed from Olivia's room. Craig dashed down the stairs to see what calamity had struck. He found his wife and daughter staring out the window at something in Olivia's window well. Kelly was cringing at the sight, but Olivia was definitely more interested than fearful. Craig followed their gaze and saw what the excitement was about. Perched in a hole that had chewed in Olivia's screen was a furry brown mouse. Craig smiled. This was going to be fun. the storage room in the basement, Craig grabbed an empty blue plastic storage tote. After a couple of tries to force the mouse into the tote, he realized he was going to need a stick of some sort. The rake handle from the garage would work perfectly. After a couple more tries, he managed to get it into the tote. Kelly was on the phone with her friend, and was informed that it was not a mouse but a vole. They were big problems in Whitewood. They dug holes in people's yards left tracks of dead grass and lawns, and multiplied as fast as a calculator. Craig loaded the vole and the toad into the car. He was going to drive it up the hill into the desert and get rid of it. That's what he told Kelly and Olivia. When he got there, he put his actual plan into effect. He set the toad on the ground and picked up a large rock. Then he picked up the toad and dumped the vole hard on the ground. It lay there for a moment, stunned and Craig crushed it with the rock. For the second time that day, Craig filled with pleasure. This was much better than the Fly King. Maybe it was because it was a bigger animal, or because it was surely smarter than a fly, but the killing ecstasy was much greater than he'd felt so far. He wondered for a moment if it would always be greater if the beast was greater. A cat? A dog? Or even a child? Craig sat on the back porch with a tennis racket in his hand. He was waiting for birds. They had a bird feeder hanging from the eaves, and the birds were always mobbing it. He'd seen as many as ten birds pecking out the seeds of the feeder and cleaning up the seeds they'd spilled onto the ground. Killing flies had grown tedious to Craig. The Fly King's death had brought him some measure of satisfaction, but nothing else did. So he sat here with his tennis racket waiting to graduate to a higher rung on the food chain. A red-headed bird that Craig couldn't guess the name of swooped in and landed on the grass. It hopped happily about as it snapped up the seeds that had fallen from the feeder. Craig moved as slowly as he could. He was careful not to raise the racket too high. Three birds had come this close before, and they had all escaped. He had figured that his skill in stalking flies would translate over to birds, 
but somehow the larger nature of his prey, or maybe it was the cumbersome tennis racket, was keeping him from success. The bird hopped astoundingly close, and Craig struck like a coiled cobra. The racket slashed through the air and connected with the bird as it sprang into the air to flee. It banged hard into the ground ten feet away. Craig walked over and looked at it. It was still twitching and thrashing. He pushed it onto the tennis racket with his foot and took it into the garage. Craig smiled contentedly. Unlike flies, he would be able to hear a bird scream. next Saturday afternoon, Kelly and Olivia hopped in the car and drove to Chuck E. Cheese. Olivia had been invited to a birthday party. Craig wasn't interested in joining them. He stayed home to watch college football. He loved the annual USC Notre Dame clash. It was midway through the third quarter when he first heard it. It sounded like someone using a weed eater a few streets down, but the noise continued to grow. Now it sounded like the weed eater was closer. Now it sounded like two. It was becoming difficult to hear Keith Jackson's play-by-play. -play. And, Craig noticed, it was becoming darker inside as well. Was it going to rain? The noise built in strength until Craig could ignore it no longer. He had to see what was making it. He got up and strode to the window, pulling back the blinds and his mouth dropped open in shock. Fear shot through every limb. A cold sweat leapt from his pores. And Craig guessed that his time on Earth had come to an end. Swirling outside his house was an enormous black cloud of house flies. The cloud of flies blocked the light of the sun. It was so dense that Craig couldn't even see the neighbors' houses behind it. Every single fly for perhaps 30 miles around was swarming outside Craig's home. The cloud flowed around the house like water, flies bumping and knocking against the window glass in front of Craig's eyes. They were trying to get in. It wasn't Olivia's imagination. Fly King's minions had come for him. Craig slammed the curtains shut and ran from room to room, making sure windows and doors were shut. He was safe in here with the windows shut, right? Then a fly buzzed into his ear. He swung wildly at it. He spun around and he saw flies pouring from the air conditioning vents in the living room. He turned to see them coming out of the vents in the kitchen and the hall. They streamed through the exhaust vent of the dryer and the cracks around the front door. They squeezed through every possible hole. The sliding glass door cracked then exploded inwards. And millions of flies flowed into the house. The buzzing noise was deafening. Craig could no longer see the walls or furniture, just swirling black no matter which way he turned. His whole body thrummed with the vibration of the millions of insect wings. Craig screamed, searching for the door to flee into the street. Then... The flies spoke to him. Not with mouths, though. Craig felt it more than heard it. It was as though the beating of the flies' wings were combining to create vibrations that his ears could interpret as speech. It has come on long enough, Craig Payne. This is our kingdom. You are an intruder here. Others we suffer because they follow the natural order of life. You are a destroyer. You have twisted the natural way of life into a sick perversion that we cannot allow to continue. Bid the world goodbye, Craig Payne. It is time to die. The swirling cloud of flies converged. Craig was thrown to the ground as millions of flies battered against his body. 
Craig screamed one last time. Then his throat filled with insects, ramming their way into his mouth and nostrils. He struggled for air as the world faded to white. Kelly screamed when she opened the front door and found Craig dead on the floor. The county sheriff's deputies could find no evidence of foul play. The sliding glass door had shattered, but nothing had been taken from the house. The neighbors reported that there had been a dark cloud in the area, and the deputies suspected that the storm had broken the glass. Paramedics said Craig had apparently suffocated, choking on an insect. There were a lot of dead flies around on the floor. Perhaps a bunch of them got in the house, and while Craig was killing them, he accidentally swallowed one. It was certainly very odd, but it was the best explanation the deputies could give. Olivia sat on Kelly's lap, hugged tight to her chest as the deputies gave their explanation. She saw a fly buzzing past the deputy's hat as he spoke. She knew inside her heart that the deputies didn't have the whole picture. She used to think flies were cute and funny as they buzzed around, flipping and dancing through the air. She liked to give them names like Buzzy, Cinderella, and Bugga Bugga. She'd called them her pets and picked favorites, but she'd never known they could do this. She looked at the fly circling the deputy's head and felt just one thing, fear. Author's note. I lived a fair amount of what happened in this story. The only difference is it didn't lead me down the merry road to insanity and death. Or did it? Well, I'm not dead anyway. I moved to a new town where the flies irritated me to no end and made me wonder how easy it could be for them to drive someone over the edge. So I made up a cute little tale about one man's journey into house fly induced madness. No, really, it's fiction. Except for one scene where I lay open the stark reality of my life. The scene where Tommy and Will don't laugh at the busybone joke. I know it's hard to believe, but that really happened. Other than that, the story is pure, mindless fantasy. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Okay, welcome back. I hope you guys enjoyed the story. I know I didn't. I mean, did. Sorry, did. Didn't you ever enjoy any stories in high school? <laughs> Let's retire the I know I did. I can't fudge and Hey, say- if we're not retiring the what I was doing in high school thing, then... Yes, but what is it? Is, why, why do you want to retire? One is funny and one is not. Why do you want to retire everything that I say but nothing that you say? Come on, man. Who, have I ever said I was having sex in high school? No, because not a single listener would believe. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Where, where do we start on this thing? This guy sent our very first story in, right? Second. Okay, you're right. Second story we ever did. Now, was that back when we did the conversation before or after the story? I don't know. To tell, I think we did it after the story at this point. I think we only did the conversation before it on the first episode. Meryl Page wrote stalled. Right. And uh, yeah, uh, okay, so then that was the second episode we did back in summer of 2008. Wow, was it that long ago? Why is this podcast still on? How come people haven't organized themselves into a mob and marched on Washington, D.C. to demand that this end? Stop the insanity. I mean, Susan Powder should have been out there campaigning against this by now. 2008? (laughs) Oh, wait, O.T., you really are a mean little cuss, aren't you? (laughs) 
Holy crap, dude. We're heading into two years almost here. Can you believe that? It's hard to believe, but I think we do good work. Uh, Stop the insanity! Okay, okay. Look, there's a buttload of podcasts. There's a new podcast starting every single day. That is true. Um, so we won't be missed. And yeah, I think that lots and lots of other possibilities are out there if, if you don't like us. But I, I guess a couple people out there do. For example, who edited this story? This story was edited by Brian Lincoln. This time, it wasn't an emergency job that he saved us on. Uh, this one he had plenty of time to work on and, and had ready for us. Now, as, as far as I understand it, if somebody wants to help us in producing an, an episode, they email us, then you send them, what, five stories, six stories, a bunch of stories, and let them choose the story they want to do. Is that right? Right, right. And you did that with Brian. How uh -huh. many stories would you say you sent him? Probably like five or six each time. But he, he strangely comes back for more. <laughs> well, he does good work. And uh, a second ago, I said there are a billion podcast. probably not a billion, 150 million podcasts starting uh -huh. up every week. He's got a podcast uh, in right. the works, or it may already exist by now. If so, we'll put it in the show notes. But I think it's fair to say that we had something to do with that, that he enjoyed the experience of participating in the podcast or artistically expressing himself. And now he's sort of gone off and, and doing his own. Am I right? Yeah. I think he had a podcast. He still has a podcast that he's been doing all along that was called The Iocane Project. Like Iocane powder? That's right. Uh -huh. What you're not smelling? What you do not smell is called Iocane powder. Yeah, he uh, he has that. What you do smell is this. <laughs> oh, no. Ew. But yeah, he has wait, that. Wait, wait, wait. I don't... What is that? What is Iocane Project? It is a podcast where they just basically talk about films or books or whatever it is. That they, basically what they feel like talking about when it comes down to it, I think. Uh, before the flies smother you, do you have the URL for that? Uh, yeah, if you want to check out his show, it's at uh, www.iocaneproject.com. You can swing over there and check out his show there. He also, the one that you're talking about, though, this is a completely separate show that he is starting up that's going to be called the Full Cast Podcast, I think. And he's basically going to discuss the art of putting together a full cast audio podcast like we do or for example he's gonna have abigail hilton on as his uh, co-host and she has just taken one of her novels that she's written and put it together as a full cast audio drama and we've done a couple of voices ourselves on that you're rambling again guys how did we get on this oh he yeah. edited the story for us yeah that's a roundabout way of me saying if you'd like to edit a story for us let us know yeah, we're definitely open to that. Because everybody has different tastes and everybody has a different sensibility. If I edit the story, it would be different than if you edit it. And True. obviously when Brian edits it, it's different than how you would do it. Um, so it sort of switches things around. Plus, it really helps us. See, when we had the disaster with the last few <laughs> episodes, I don't believe that Kingdom of Flies was supposed to be next. Maybe it was, but maybe it was. But you've moved it here. Isn't that weird that I can hear that in my voice, even though I'm not trying to do it? <laughs> a second ago, we each did a Christopher Walken impersonation. And now I can hear it when I pause in a sentence, but I'm not pausing to be Christopher Walken. <laughs> <laughs> so because he helped us out, we were able to do this story closer to the schedule that we initially wanted. And, you know, if you want to help us out, it, it takes a lot of the weight off of Big's shoulders. Yeah, it would be nice to get help. Okay, so Kingdom of Flies, scale from 1 to 10, how freaked out about flies are you? I'm not especially freaked out about flies. Now, now everybody's had, unless you live in Greenland, you've had a fly crawl over your face or on your lips or whatever. Does that freak you out? It doesn't freak me out, but it does make me very angry. Like, the worst thing I think in the world is when you're trying to sleep, for example. You've passed out in a puddle of your own filth. Right. And now the flies are being drawn to this filth and they're buzzing around you. You can't just continue to sleep. The fly will keep buzzing around and they'll go right past your ear and be like, Zzz! and they, they keep like buzzing you till you basically have to get up. And the worst part is if you get up and you get the fly swatter and you kill this fly, you're up. It's woke you up enough that you're not just going to be like, okay, now I got it. I'm going to lay back down and go right back to sleep. 
that's the thing that I hate about flies, man. There's just nothing worse than that. If I ever know that there's a fly in my bedroom when I'm trying to go to bed, I'll make sure that I kill it before I go to sleep because otherwise it'll torment me, I'm sure, for the rest of the night. Now, I'm not a very educated person, as yeah. any listener could tell, but I, I believe that flies have a very short lifespan and they're not very intelligent. But there have been times when I feel like a fly is bothering me because it knows it bothers me. <laughs> you know, or there'll be a time when you try and swat a fly and instead of fleeing, going as far away as possible, it will turn around and come straight at you. You know, things like that. Yeah. There may actually be some kind of intelligence going on here. So it, the two of your three children are probably smarter than a fly. But there's got to be some intelligence here. Wow. Right? Wouldn't you flee from a predator rather than, oh, I'm going to get revenge on this predator that tried to kill me? Yeah, you would think. I don't know what kind of instincts a fly might have. It seems like that would be kind of a good strategy. And if that thing stuck too close to your face, you wouldn't be able to get it. You know what I mean? If flies everywhere knew this, they would never get swatted. As soon as a person comes around, just go right around their head. And what do you do? You just hit yourself in the face or whatever, but you never actually kill a fly. I don't know. Flies are... How do you classify a fly? It's not a parasite. Is it a pest? An insect? Hmm? Well, yes, I think it is an insect, <laughs> sir. But I, I'm not really bothered by flies. In fact, I sort of like them. It's weird, but ever since I was a little kid, I would enjoy chasing them through the house to catch them in my hand. You know, they're up against the screen of the window and I catch it and I would like to listen to the sound of it going uh -huh. in my hand. And that's something that I don't think has ever really gone away. Yeah. For me, I don't know if it makes me feel godlike <laughs> or if it's just a pleasant sensation of the wings flying around in my hand. And Is, is that unusual, do you think? When was the last time you caught a fly in your hand? I don't know if I have, to tell you the truth. Wait, wait, wait I'm not... ever? I'm not very coordinated. I, ha I think I have caught flies underneath a cup. Maybe, I think I've even got them a, under a glass where you can actually see inside of it and see them buzz around and sit there. Do you find that sound to be pleasurable? I don't think so. Okay. I think it bugs me too much. The worst, weird, I would then. say, is a mosquito right by your ear, though, than a fly. At my house, there's been a fair number of flies in the past. We kind of live out in the middle of nowhere as we've mentioned before, and there's farms nearby, and there's a lot of flies that come around here, and they kind of drive me a little crazy. My kids are kind of like the ones in the story, where they just run out the door and leave the door open. That can be pretty annoying. I guess it, it's sort of this way with all animals, but I've always really enjoyed nature and, and animals, but whether they're spiders or flies or beetles or I, some people call them roly polies uh -huh. I, I, we, I always called them potato bugs although technically i don't think they are potato bugs yeah i think potato bugs are some um, kind of nasty ugly really large thing but i really like the fat green or blue or blue bottle flies whatever they call them you know what i'm talking about the ones that are like a quarter of an inch yeah in I size. Think I know what you're saying when my sister was a little kid she really liked those things, and it may be that she just knew that I enjoyed playing with potato bugs or whatever it might be. It's like, oh, hey, there's a moth or whatever it is. I'm going to catch it. Maybe because she also liked the sensation of him crawling on your hand. And then I remember we had a cousin over one time. She probably was four or five years old, and she had caught a bug. And the cousin went, ah, ah, kind of thing. And instantly, oh, my gosh, she threw it down. He's like, what a horror. And now... My sister, you know, is a full-grown woman, and if her kids pick up a bug, it suddenly it's that, yeah, well, no, don't do it, yeah, kind of thing. And I, I, I'm willing to bet that it's because of that reaction hmm. that she had, where she was told that something that she got pleasure from was icky or nasty or horrible or frightening. And now, you know, she's one of those people that if there's a spider in the bathtub, you know, ah, ah, kill it. I'm more of a catch it and let it go outside kind of person. Yeah, one of my daughters is really likes to grab bugs and caught like praying mantises in our yard or something yeah. like that. And she just stands there and wants to hold it. And praying mantises have wings and can't fly especially well, but they can fly. And she'll be standing there holding this thing and eventually it flies away. And then she gets so upset and will cry because she doesn't have a bug. Really? She has no pet anymore to play with or whatever. She had this great bug. Well, if, if you would euthanize your cat, I'm sure we could come up with something to give to your daughter that would be fun but really really easy to take care of something 
like a box turtle that you need to feed once a month or something like uh-huh. that. Uh-huh. And it goes away for three or four months during the year. Um, Sounds like a good idea, euthanizing a cat at least. It, I guess it's too cold to get the lawnmower out. <laughs> it's funny because I was just saying how much I like animals. Yeah. And, that, and then I We haven't this. talked about cats in a long time either, have we? Well, I think somebody, I think it might have been Abby. I was listening to her podcast and in the background you heard... And I just thought, hey, stop, stop recording, please. <laughs> and two, well, how can you continue to love a cat <laughs> when it's ruining your podcast? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I meant to blog about this, but I'll just do it on the podcast. I went to the Goodwill type store the other day as I was looking for books. I like to buy used books. And sometimes you'll find books from like the 70s and stuff, you know, that aren't in print anymore. And uh, I saw one of those stuffed Spider-Man dolls from 2002 uh-huh. that were everywhere. But now they're not. Right. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, because my sister's kid, the two-year-old, loves Spider-Man. And I want to foster that. To support that, yeah. He's got a brother that is into, like, Pokemon stuff. Ooh, yeah, get Spider-Man we, we going. We want, yeah, to support the things that don't suck. And so I picked it up, and I was going to buy it. And I figured, well, okay, it used to belong to somebody else, so I'll at least put it through the dryer or something, <laughs> assuming that that will decontaminate it. Okay, and as I was carrying it around and I went to the book section, my eyes started to burn and my, my no, you know, it's just like, holy cow, what is that smell? And I looked and this Spider-Man doll was covered with white cat hairs, just covered. <laughs> and they were all over my hand and stuff. And it was, ha, 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 I guess much in the same way that my sister's friend or cousin went, eh, when she was holding a bug. And I had to put it back. There was no way I was going to give it to my nephew now. Although I probably could have put it through the dryer and got rid of all that stuff. But it just, it was so gross, dude. <laughs> if, in case you're a new listener, I'm allergic to cats. And that's why I was just like, oh, oh, you know, it's sneezing or, you know, my lungs were contracting. I, I think it's great that you people love cats, but I just don't get it. How could you? It's funny because when we talked about cats the last time, that was way back in early 2009, I want to say. And this was when my cat was still sort of a kitten-ish. My cat might be more or less the same age as the podcast. The thing likes people less and less every day. I think my cat is what the uh, term frady cat was invented to describe. Yeah, it's afraid of absolutely everything, especially me for some reason. If I'm walking anywhere near it, it like gets that kind of wild look on its face and it looks around. Oh, there's got to be like a, a hole or something I can dive through to escape. It treats me as though I every time I pass it, give it a good strong kick, which really pisses me off because I haven't earned that reputation. I feel like I should have gotten at least the pleasure of kicking that cat a whole bunch of times yeah. for it to treat me as though I have. And I didn't even get that. And yet I'm still required to feed this stupid animal that hates everyone in my house. My wife, I think it tolerates. For me and the rest of us, it's pure revulsion. It's not earning its place in the household, that's for sure. Keep those cards and letters coming, folks. In the last three or four months, the computer would crash every time I came over, sometimes Uh multiple times, and we would make it a habit of, okay, when the computer crashes, we'll go for a walk. And several times when we go outside, there's a neighbor cat that only has three legs (laughs) that I'll see hanging around your house. Now, if you were the one responsible for it only having three legs, maybe I could understand (laughs) that word got back to your cat. Right. But just, okay, right here, let's clear the air. Did you cut off the leg of that cat i was not the one that did that okay well see then it's all unfounded the cat has been hearing this neighborhood gossip (laughs) and if the cat would just go to you you would set it straight but i have never yet cut off the leg of a cat that reminds me uh, okay in the story the guy starts with flies and then he goes to voles is that right (laughs) right Uh, and then he goes to doing birds right and after that okay what's the biggest animal you've ever killed I think it would be Corey Haim. (laughs) Hey, man, that's not cool. He's an American icon. None of us would be alive if it weren't for Haim. They're going to put him on a stamp someday. (laughs) No, you know, I've never run over an animal in my car or anything like that. Although recently I've actually come close a couple of times. I've had some cats dart in front of my car and I've just narrowly avoided them. 
But yeah, I don't think that I've ever actually killed an animal that wasn't an insect. Well, Maybe a... a frog. I'm I'm sure I've probably killed a frog before. <laughs> Why? I love frogs more than life itself. Yeah, mm. well, I was a kid. Come on. you. Bet. I think I've killed a snake. Recently? No. I come from a household. I, I come from a whole entire community where hunting is a big deal. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, there's a pheasant hunt, there's a deer hunt, there's an elk hunt, there's a Lady Gaga hunt, there's a your fishing season and all that. And I, I guess I just never, I don't know what the deal is. See, I've always been an animal lover, and my mom used to say that she knew that I was going to be a veterinarian from when I was a very little kid. It would have been something, at <laughs> least. When I was a teenager, a bunch of guys, they started doing this thing where we'd go up into the hills and hunt rabbits with shotguns. Mm -hmm. Was it with shotguns? Jeez, that's barbaric, isn't it? <laughs> but I think it was. Doesn't really give him much of a chance. Um, you, sir, are worse than Hitler. It all seemed like fun, but then uh, I didn't realize that rabbits make a sound. <laughs> and they'd be rolling on the ground in their death Squealing. throes, and they'd be screaming. Uh. And it sounded very much like, well, it sounded like a little animal, but, you know, it wasn't too far from, you know, a child screaming or something like that. And that upset me. I, you know, I'm sure they called me a pussy and all that stuff, but it's just one of those things. I, I've, I've got a soft spot with, with animals, and my dad loved to fish, and, and that's something that I still enjoy doing because it's sort of a relaxing thing and uh -huh. doesn't take it much skill that I've seen. But when it came time to clean the fish, see, uh, I, I, if there's any people, if there's any you city-fied folk listening, what you do is you run a, a cord through the mouth of the fish and out the gill – and you put all of the fish on this cord, and you leave the fish in the water. And until they've come out of the water, they don't die. They're just uncomfortable because they have this cord in their mouth, and it keeps them fresh, keeps them from drying out. So they're desperately trying to swim away the whole time. And then when it's time for us to go, we've got our limit, or it starts to rain, or whatever it is, my dad would take them out, and he would clean the fish. And what you would do is you put a pocket knife into the anus of the fish and slice it from bottom up. And it just horrified me that these fish were alive when he did it. And so when I got old enough, like 12 or 13, where I was expected to clean the fish, the thought that these fish were alive when I was doing this just really upset me. And, and he would say, well, then you've got to hit the fish on a rock, hit its head on a rock until it's dead. And then it won't feel it. And that's almost as bad. But it's something that to this day, when I go out and go fishing, and I'm one of the only people I know that knows how to clean a fish. It's weird. I guess that's just not in the upbringing of people in Sacramento or, or uh -huh. Puerto Rico or whatever. It might Acidified be. folk don't understand that stuff. Yes, yeah, so slickers like you. But I always just overkill these poor animals <laughs> just hitting their heads on the rock again and again and again justifying it i guess subconsciously that two seconds of extreme pain <laughs> right now will kill them so they don't have to slowly die from being eviscerated anyway maybe i should cut all this stuff out you said it rich but <laughs> this is a sick story with the flies going in the guy's <laughs> face and mouth and nose and all that stuff so if you haven't lost your lunch already me talking about how you got a fish is not going to do it for yeah yeah it was interesting doing the voice sounds for this guy being suffocated by the flies i remember you were like you you want to try doing some, some choking sounds and so i started doing that and i think i actually took my hands and stuck them down into my mouth really far just to try and make the sound as realistic as possible and i remember causing myself to gag pretty strongly in doing that i believe in some circles this is known as the stanislavski method of acting that could be true Indeed. my throat and uh i guess it's all for the art so it was worthwhile it's interesting that you're talking about the rabbits and the shotgun when I was like 13 or 12 or something like that, we had a family reunion at my mom's sister's. She lived in the middle of Eureka, Nevada, and they had a farm out there. You know, I was bored stiff. Not only was I a city-fied kid, but I was also an early teenager where everything sucks and everything is boring and forth, and I had nothing to do. And I, But one of the things that we did while we were there is they had their junk pile or whatever it was. it was fairly big you know junkyard where they put their garbage and there was rats or squirrels or whatever it was all over in this junk 
And one of my uh, brother-in-laws, he had a bunch of his guns there with him. And so he's like, oh, let's go and shoot at these squirrels or whatever. So we went out there and I had no idea how to shoot a gun. My, you know, brother and father and brother-in-law were all picking some of these things off. And there was a time where <laughs> one of these squirrels, it was as close as you are to me. And I'm standing there with this rifle in my hand pointed, trying to hit this thing. And here I squeeze the trigger and I still missed it by like five feet or so. The thing ran off. So I didn't get to hear the squealing rabbit and get sick. Oh, they were rabbits. No, I'm just saying. You know, I think they were squirrels. In my defense, and me, I probably need a lot right now. Yeah, I never did the rabbit hunting thing again after that. To be honest, I don't think I ever killed one on the hunt. I, I'm not a good shot. <laughs> that was my problem. Nobody ever explained to me, okay, you got to do this and do this to use your sight. You got to line this up inside of this or whatever it was. Or maybe they did and I was just a stupid idiot that couldn't figure it out. I don't know. Second choice is probably more likely. I think Big is right. I'm assuming, do we have any people in England or the UK that listen to the show? I think Marcus was from the UK. Oh, dude, do you have to bring full Marcus into all this? In England, they don't have the gun culture that we do. Uh-huh. I guess even in Canada, they don't really have the gun culture that we do, do they? I don't think so. I wonder how that is seen, or this awful talk that we're having about killing the animals or, or whatever it might be. If that scene is barbaric or a throwback to another time... It seems uniquely American, although I, there have got to be other countries. I, 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 what, are, what do Aussies think about guns? They hunt crocodiles and crap out there, don't they? Or, or is that just Probably not with ND shotguns. that did that? For the most part, the whole need to carry a gun or going out and, and slaying your dinner, that's a thing of the past. Pretty much. And, and my cousin that I often talk about, they all lived in Alaska, and I guess... In Alaska, it's, it's still just something that you do is you carry a gun because there are bears, because there are moose, because Sarah Palin is there. It's just that they're out in the wild or so close to the wild uh -huh. that there's still the threat of... Well, there are the Russians right across the uh, Bering Strait there, too, so maybe that's why they... Aren't they our friends now? They're waiting for Red Dawn to uh, finally come to pass, and they're just ready for it. This conversation has derailed. Uh, yeah, I guess we have derailed a little bit. We were going to talk about a couple other things that didn't have to do with torture of animals or even death of animals. I can't imagine what any of those things would be. <laughs> have you ever seen a chinchilla? Have you ever beaten a chinchilla with a board with nails in it? <laughs> One thing that we need to talk about, this is going to seem slow on the uptake because most people have already blogged about this for weeks, but recently the uh, Hugo nominations came out. I don't know if you're like me. But it was only a few years ago when I was basically introduced to the Hugos. The first time Steve Ely on Escape Pod podcasted all the short stories that were up for Hugos. And I was pretty excited to, to hear those. And then the next year I was already looking forward to it. And one of those stories is still to this day one of my favorite stories that has ever been on Escape Pod. And that was Tim Pratt's Impossible Dreams. I just loved that story. It was almost like it was written for me or something. But it wasn't. It was It was no. written for me. Yeah. And each time I get more and more excited about the Hugos. And this time around, it seems like podcasts in general are starting to be a bigger deal and get recognized as well. I mean, we saw that Tony C. Smith's Starship Sofa podcast was nominated for the Hugo for uh, Best Fanzine, which is kind of a big deal. That This is the first time that a podcast has been nominated for Hugo, correct? I think so, yeah. Even if it doesn't win, it's still kind of a landmark achievement, I guess, because now that one has been nominated, I think the idea that you can vote for a podcast as well is in people's minds. So in 2011, everybody can rush out and vote for the Dune, Steve. They won't. <laughs> but it's, it's very much like when Babe was nominated for Best Picture. That opens the floodgates to talking animal pictures being nominated. Right. Never happened again, but still. That's a perfect example. Thanks. I talked already about how Escape Pod would podcast the short story nominations every year. And it seems like each year, more and more of those stories have already been podcast to the point that this year, half of them have already been on podcasts before they were ever even nominated. I think that kind of shows you where podcasts are at these days. Do you get as excited about Hugo's as I do, or is this something that hasn't lit under you yet? 
I'm not as well read as you are. I don't. I've never read a book actually, and, okay. and I, I, I that's that's not true. I've never read a book not written by Theodore Geisel. But uh, I did read through the Hugo nominations, and amazingly, I recognized. 50% of those writers, probably, and that wouldn't have been the case a year ago or the year before. Part of it is just being in the podcasting community. Uh -huh. You'll hear other people mention stuff that's good, or you'll hear on a podcast a story by Pablo Garfield. <laughs> and these things stick out of my mind because I, I feel like I'm more familiar with them, and suddenly there they are. Like, I mean, if we were doing a story by Cory Doctorow next week or something like that, I would be like, oh my gosh, I know who that is. Uh -huh. I've heard his work. And yeah, that, that would know. be cool. So I'm not as excited as you are because you make it a goal to read all of the nominated, yeah. what, novellas? No, novelettes? This year, I think I'm going to try and read all of the novels that were nominated and see if I can actually get them read before they get to the awards in, what is it, August or September or whenever they're finally going to have it. I kind of try and read all the short stuff, like a novelette and the short stories. Novellas tend to be a little longer, and sometimes I can't manage to read that many words. That's a lot of words. Didn't you read all of the Hugo-nominated books in high school? <laughs> no. Say it with me, folks. I was having sex in high school! Terrible. Last year at this time when the nominees came out, I was thinking maybe we ought to try and do something like Escape Pod does because they have been doing all the short stories. But what about like the novelettes? They're a little bit longer. Maybe we could look into podcasting those stories. By the time I ever came up with this idea, it was always too late. But I was thinking maybe we can manage that this year. And I noticed that pretty much all the novelettes have already been podcasted. So I don't know if it will even be worth our while to bother. I don't know. Well, hopefully the reason that this is the case is that authors realize that there's a lot of people that are fans of speculative fiction, but either don't have the money or don't have the time to sit down and read the work that comes in the magazine or the, wherever these are available. But they would listen to them in an audio format, and that gains them a bunch of new fans every time somebody podcasts their works, even if they end up not getting paid for it. I believe Starship Sofa doesn't pay. Right. I think that's what makes them a fanzine versus a semi-pro zine is that they pay nothing. And yet you still get great stories from big authors over there. Well, I would think it's because it's in a way free advertising, but it's also almost a, an art form in itself. The same way that Somebody who wrote a short story might sell that story to The Twilight Zone or to some anthology, The Outer right. Limits. You know, they still have their story, but here's a visual version of that. Or before that, the radio shows. There were tons and tons of radio theater kind of things where yeah. writers had an outlet to sell their work. And it would reach a whole new audience that would never, ever find the story in yeah, that's how I was first introduced to Ray Bradbury when I was a kid. I had a brother-in-law who he had, I think he had a tape, an audio book of a whole bunch of different uh, Ray Bradbury short stories. And I think we went camping once and he brought a tape recorder along with him. And each night we'd sit down and listen to a couple of these stories. From that time on, you know, I went out, I got like Martian Chronicles and read that. I read the Illustrated Man and a whole bunch of other Bradbury stuff that I probably would have never cared about had I not had that experience to be introduced to it. So it is definitely a way to gain more fans. There's many different ways to tell stories. And you see authors, for example, like Neil Gaiman, he writes books. He also has movies that are being made of his stories. He does comic books he's heavily involved in. I think he was nominated for Hugo for the Batman comic. Yeah, that's right. He was nominated for a comic book this year, whereas last year he won Best Novel for the Graveyard Book. And I think he was also nominated for Coraline this year as well. So uh, For the movie? Right, the movie, not the book. The book came out years ago, I think. So oh, That's amazing. You reach a whole different category of people when you put out a film versus a comic book or putting out a regular book. And he does kids' books. And I wouldn't be surprised if he's got video games based on things that he's come up with. Audio fiction and podcasts, just another way. I mean, Neil Gaiman performs a lot of his own audio as well. I, I've listened to several books that he did himself, and he's really good, too. He's got a great uh, voice for reading. It's pretty impressive. Well, maybe we'll talk more about the Hugos later on. I, I suppose we have months before the awards. But congratulations to Tony Smith. Yeah. Over at Starship Sofa. 
it's really cool to have participated in a podcast that got nominated for yeah. you, right? I expect one of those trophies to be sent to my house, Tony, if you win. Rich, you're such an idiot. Wait, wait, wait what? I didn't say it. He, that's, isn't that the second time he's done that? Yeah, but he's still right. Sorry, man. Hey, oh, another thing that we needed to mention. Uh, we recorded recently an interview with Miss Abigail Hilton, who you've probably heard before on this show, if you've listened to any episode other than today's, or maybe even today's. I don't know what the hell this is going to be on, for that matter. She's doing that uh, full cast audio production of her book, Cowrie Catchers. And in the interim between segments of her book, because she's got it divided up into like five segments that are like novella length, They're not quite novel length, but the whole thing comes out to like 300,000 words or something like that. So she split them up into five pieces. She's finished piece one, and in between, to keep those folks wanting more, she's keeping them warmed up with great things like interviews with guys on the Dune Steve podcast. Can you imagine how hard up she must have been (laughs) to interview us? And yeah, it wasn't like she wasted five minutes of her life. She wasted a huge chunk of her life interviewing us. Yeah, missed out on a lot of sleep because, you know, we don't start until one in the morning and we're on a different time zone than she is. So that makes it even worse. If you're interested to hear what we had to say, go over there and check it out. Her show is at CowrieCatchers.com, right? You can find that at the dot schlong domain. Whoa! Sorry. Uh, yeah, that's C-O-W-R-Y Catchers.com. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. And if you haven't listened to it, it's a good story. And me and Rish got lines here and there. If you just can't get enough of the dulcet sounds of our voices. And yeah, if you have had enough of the dulcet sounds, uh, then why are you still listening? But also, we're barely in it. Yeah, so seriously. Just, yeah, do not hold that against her. Yeah, they got good folks over there doing like the important characters. Norm Sherman, for example, does a, a very important character in the show. So check that out. It's good stuff. Okay, episode is over. We are done. Wait, shoot, there's one more thing we got to say. Listen, if you've stuck with us through this whole episode, (laughs) thank you. And like we said last week. Submissions are open. If you've got a story, send it in. Okay, we used to say this in every single episode, but we're going to say it now. Please read the submission guidelines. Sometimes people will send us stories, and it's so obvious they haven't read the guidelines. And if it were in my power, I would just instantly reject those, but... I'm too nice because of the poor little animals I saw suffering. Um, please read the submission guidelines. And once you have, send us your story in the body of an email to submissions at doonsteef.com. And like we said last week, if you would like to help us read our submissions, our slush, um, just let us know over at editor at doonsteef.com. We'll send some of those out to you. It, it, it does us a great service because last year, at like the height of our busyness or whatever you want to call it, we get a couple every single day yeah. submissions and there's just no way that we could read them all and get back to people. You know, we'd have to say, expect one year before you hear back. <laughs> Thank you, Meryl Page, for sending us this story. Yeah, thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for sticking through our uh, conversation, if you did. The rest of you who skipped, thanks for listening to as much as you did. Wait, wait, they're not hearing you. Don't oh. thank them if they've skipped. Oh, that's right. Uh, yeah, so I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. It's no secret that a conscience can sometimes be a pest. Like a fly on a wall, it's no secret at all. See ya. Thanks for spending time with us. If you're ever in a generous mood, or even if you're not, we'd love it if you donated. Please, press the button. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, meaning share it with everyone, but don't sell it or change it. Good night, everybody. Take two. Craig imagined the fly shrieking in pain. He wished he could hear it. What do you call a guy with no legs and no arms sitting on your front porch? Matt. No, Craig, that joke is in bad taste. (laughs) 
If your lint squirt if your lint screen is clear and your clothes aren't getting as dry quickly as if your lint screen is clear and your clothes aren't getting as dry basically you just need to replace it every time uh. <laughs> I don't really listen to hip hop anymore but back in the day you wouldn't believe it I mean it was like horrors all the time and that that you know that 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 that, that alcohol that's so cheap that they serve it in a paper sack oh wow I just love Guys, don't kill that fly. He's my pet. He's your pet, is he? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who is the queen of the flies? Tinkerbell? She is lord of the flies, daddy. <laughs> Lucifer, in other words. I'd never harm you, Olivia. I love you, Olivia. Is that what your mother said? That I would pull your wings off? In England, they don't have the gun culture that we do. Uh huh. I guess even in Canada, they don't really have the gun culture that we do, do they? I don't think so. It seems kind of uniquely American. And then also just like the really, really shitty countries like Sudan and all that where they have the child soldiers. <laughs> Did Mrs. Outfield ever have any children that lived? Just for you, Wendy and Liz. <laughs> Do you get as excited about Hugo's as I do, or is this something that hasn't lit under you yet? I'm more interested in the Tony nominations. Fabulous. Oh, okay, Sorry. I get it. That's just for you and Liz. Yeah, Wendy, you'll sit this one out. Nice one. Let us know if you sent a submission by sending us a submission. Huh? Uh, Rish, you're such an idiot. No, no. Wait. Okay, in this case, that's probably applicable. Thank you, Meryl Page, for sending us this story. I guess it's been a year and a half. Send us something uh, sooner than that, man. I mean, unless he sent us like four stories and they were all rejected. <laughs> <sighs> when they come at you. Wait, I had a quote. It was, it was from The Godfather. <laughs> hey, that ain't funny, man. You use my words against me, spirit. Dishonor on you, dishonor on your cow. Uh. Wow. My, my, my poker face. Uh, my poker face. Can't uh, read my. Can't read my poker face. <laughs> I don't know the lyrics, but I put my pants on one leg at a time. Russian roulette is not the same without a gun.